right, well, Tobias, thank you for that uh, gracious introduction here. So uh, good afternoon, folks. My name is Chris Romeo, and uh, I've been involved in the security world for about 20 years now. I've done many different jobs along the, uh, my, my path um, that's, that's brought me into application security. I uh, started my own company in January of this year, but before that I spent 10 years at Cisco as part of the uh, secure development lifecycle team there and was able to build a lot of interesting things and learn a lot of interesting things you know, in my time there. So here's, here's my agenda for what I want to speak with you about today. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is why would you even need this thing that I call application security awareness? What's, what's the benefit of it? Um, I want to talk a little bit about security culture and how that's impacted through application security. And then I'll, I'll dive into, you know, providing my five years of experience in building these types of programs. I'll walk you through an, an outline for how I think you can build one of these in your own organization and how you can take the things that made my program successful and do them in your environment as well. Uh, so first, there's a famous philosopher from Silicon Valley of all places by the name of Mark Andreessen. Um, and he, he made this statement a couple of years ago. And, you know, if you're in this room, if you're at an OWASP conference, you probably live and die this, this idea that software is everywhere. You know, it is in all the things that you build, web apps, mobile apps, all the way down to power plants, medical devices, smartphones. But the point is that software is definitely eating the world at this point. So, um, and, and when you have customers, the landscape has really changed for customer expectations for security. You know, um, customers demand that security be built into everything that you provide them today. You're not going to sit across from the table and have a customer go, well, you know, availability is important, all these other things. Security is not that important to me. You're not going to find that person these days. So you have to find ways to build application security practices and knowledge into your development organization. I love coming and speaking at OWASP events and AppSec conferences because you don't have to put up the OWASP top 10 slide. You can jump right to the results. But our, uh, our good friends at Veracode did this interesting analysis in their State of the Vulnerability Report. And I, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, it's, it's, I, I shouldn't have been surprised at all by the results of this, but look at this. You know, on, on the first assessment against the OWASP top 10 in these different categories, you know, financial services failed 58% of the time, and that was the best score po available. All the way up to government company, government you know, agencies failing this assessment 76% of the time on the first try. So, you know, the point is that the problem space is there, and everyone in the room, you know, lives and breathes this problem space every day. And so when I start to think about what do we do in a given program, um, I, I have to stop and think about, you know, what's the source of the vulnerabilities that are coming in here? You know, we all have a development life cycle of some form, and, but I don't find that the vulnerabilities are introduced very often in the test and release phases. Right? You could say that maybe some come in from a requirements phase because someone made a bad requirement decision, but the, the majority of these vulnerabilities are coming in from a design and development time. You know, it might be a mistake or it might be a bad or uninformed decision. Both of these are things that we can counter with knowledge. Now I have to put up this, the, the obligatory slide that shows how much more expensive it is you know, to, to fix bugs earlier in the process. Um, and we all know this, you know, um, it's 30 times more, in, and the, the better we can prepare our developers and the more we can push to the left is always a good thing to do. So let's talk about the mindset of the average developer. Let's, let's, let's get inside their head for a minute. And just to let you know, there probably are no average developers according to my definition here in this room right now because you're at an AppSec conference, right? I guess that doesn't make you, you can still be ordinary and, and not weird, but... Um, <laughs> But when I, when I talk about the average developer, this is somebody who doesn't yet really understand security, but you're asking them to write code for you. And the, you know, the, the goals that they, that they work for, they want to be bug free, as bug-free as possible, but not necessarily caring from a security perspective. They want to be on time, they want to be feature complete, they want to be on budget. These are all the things that are going through their mind. You know? um, you're going to have two out of three, good, fast, cheap. You know, the, this is, this is in, in the, the average developer's mindset here. Um, and so what I think we need to do is I think that we need to end up with developers that think like security people. 
Okay, now everybody throws around the term, we want, I want my developers to think like a hacker. No, I disagree. I don't want my developers to think like a hacker. I don't want them to be, think like criminals, right? I want them to think like security people, people that understand you know, all, of the, all of the pieces of application security. We want that light bulb to go on in their head. And we've all, we've all experienced this where you're mentoring somebody and working with them, and all of a sudden, they didn't know anything about security, and then poof, the light bulb goes on, they go, oh, wait a minute, I get it. All right, I gotta go you know, check all my code that I've written, and, and I know I've made these problems, and I've had these problems in the past, I gotta go fix them. So, um, you know, we're not trying to turn everybody into a security expert, that's just not reasonable, right? If you have, you know, the, the scale of organizations that I work with today and that I've worked with in the past, you know, if you have 20,000 developers, you're not gonna have 20,000 security experts, but you can have 20,000 people that have some basic understanding of, of the problem. So another philosopher of Silicon Valley, um, Tim Ferriss, actually came out with this definition, and I added a couple of words to it because I thought it was kind of an interesting way to think about security culture. So he, he defines, you know, with my additions, I define with his help, security culture as what happens with security when people are left to their own devices. And so do people make the right decisions when nobody's watching, when, you know, the, maybe the process isn't, isn't following them, you know, so tightly? Um, so yeah, I mean, do, do, they, do they make the right decisions? Because we want to teach people to make the right decisions for security. Now, I think, you know, if, if we boil this down to what, what the problem space looks like, first of all, application security is about the people, okay? And the people are the one that, ones that introduce the vulnerabilities. Now, when I share those two points, this is not a popular theme with the tool vendor crowd, and so if anybody's in here, please don't throw anything at me, but, but you know, tools are not the answer. Tools are, are good to, to help you know, reinforce, and, but you need the people to understand these concepts first, because if you turn them loose with a tool, what are they, you know, there's nothing, they're not gonna have any success if they don't have the background foundational knowledge to what uh, needs to happen. Um, so, so why would we even wanna change a security culture? So first, the people are making bad decisions, perhaps, like the guy in that tattoo, you know, clearly I've made some bad decisions tattooed on his back. Um, the second thing that, that could cause us to have to change the security culture is maybe, maybe the security process is broken or it's non-existent. So if you don't have a process for what you expect developers to do, then you have a, you have a very weak security culture at that point. And then perhaps you do have tools, but they're not tuned and they're not you know, they're not really adding any value to, you know, to your developers and, and to the process that they go through. So I think of um, a couple of different features that describe what I think of as a sustainable security culture. And it's not, a, um, it's not a, an accident that I underlined that word sustainable because security culture, it, it's something that you want, to, you want to have continue over time. Okay, you don't, want to, you don't want to just spend a whole bunch of money and a whole bunch of resources this year to say, we're going to fix security, right? Because if you just throw the money at it for a year and then you, you go away and leave things to their own, um, slowly things are just going to drift back to the way they are. So that you have to have this idea of a sustainable or ongoing security culture. And the first feature that I think about from this perspective is it has to be deliberate and it has to be disruptive. If you are not pissing somebody off with the security culture changes you're making, if someone's not in your office going, this is stupid, I hate it, then you didn't go far enough. You were being too nice in, in your approach to changing, you know, kind of the world there. Uh, the second thing is it has to be engaging and fun, okay? We don't, pe people wanna, wanna have fun, they wanna be entertained. This is an entertainment culture that we live in now. Um, so you have to ensure that anything you try to do from a security culture perspective, you know, has a theme, has, um, you know, don't take yourselves too seriously. That's one of the, the themes I've learned over all of my time in, in building these programs is, you know, if you're having fun doing something, like changing culture, other people will want to join in and have fun with it. But if you're, you know, the stone-faced auditor approach, um, nobody wants to jump in and, and, and participate with that. The third thing is uh, it has to be re rewarding. A sustainable security culture has to be rewarding. Every organization has different ways that they can reward people. In some organizations, it's really easy to just throw money, you know, small amounts of money at people to reward them. Um, catch people do it when they're doing something right and actually reward them for it. Reinforce the behavior that you're trying to, you know, to have, have done. And the fourth thing is, you know, we have to keep the management folks happy, so we have to be able to demonstrate return on investment, you know, in this, in this type of a security culture change. 
um, approach. So how do, we, how do we actually change a security culture? Well, we have to focus on the humans. And so the first thing that I think of is, you know, I kind of break this problem down into a couple of different areas. The first thing we have to do is we have to open their eyes. Okay? And remember, we're talking about that average developer, average tester, who maybe gets their security information from the news, you know, according to the latest data breach or something. Um, so, you know, we have, to, we have to help them to understand what is the, why do they even care about application security? Um, what, is the, what is the impact to them? And I think that's one of, the, one of the places where we do a really bad job in the world of training these days is we don't start with the why. We don't start with saying, why is this even something you need to care about? We throw technical details and facts at people, and we show them how to you know, use SQL injection and things. But if you don't set that foundation in the beginning to say, you know, here's what can go wrong with that. You know, most data breaches are a result of this SQL injection attack, which causes data from yourself, from your family members, from your friends to all be disclosed and cause them a lot of challenges. When you format that why for people, it just really helps them to understand you know, the, the direction that they need to go in. And then the second, the second piece of this is, has a couple of different facets, and that's filling their brains. Okay, so this is, what, what are the basic pieces of knowledge? And I'll share some of those here in a few minutes, but what are the basic pieces of knowledge that we want the developers to have in their head here? You know, what are the techniques? What are the um, role-specific things? What are the lessons learned that we've had as a development shop over time that cause an impact, you know, from our particular, our particular uh, things that we develop. Then the second piece of this filling their brain is history. So every organization has had some number of vulnerabilities that have been found in their code over the lifetime of the organization. And so what we need to do with history is we need to make sure that we, we channel that information and we make it available in, in a consumable way so that everybody that's a developer knows that you know, we have a top 10, we have a top three, whatever it is within our organization. And it may not match the OWASP top 10. That's the funny thing, you know. Um, your organization may have certain things that it just are, have bigger problems, you know. Maybe it's not, maybe injection's not the biggest problem. Maybe it's cross-site scripting or, you know, access control or something else. But you need to make sure that that historical record of here's the bugs and things, vulnerabilities that we've had gets brought forward so that we can, your, your organization can attempt to not repeat these problems again. Because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to squash the things, the biggest challenges we've had in the past. And the third part of filling their brains is uh, we have to do something on the knowledge side that's role specific. So I always advocate for starting with, a, with a, just a basic layer of knowledge and um, I'll show you that here in just a second. But, but developers, they, they want to go deeper into the things that are specific to them. And so, you know, you, you want to have knowledge-based content that's specific for a web developer versus C, Java embedded. You know, provide them some things that are specific to their world. Um, include bugs that are specific to that language in that, in that knowledge that you provide to them so that they can really get a perspective on, you know, what's, what should be important for them. And then the, uh, the third point of this is this idea of tasking their hands. And I find that this is one of the most, that this generates the, some of the biggest return of any of these programs that I've built. Because traditionally, we just put people in a classroom, we fill them up with a bunch of knowledge, and we throw them back into the development world and say, fly, be free, be successful. And you know what happens over a six-month time? That's what the chart looks like. Here's where they were in training. And over six months, they get to the point where they've almost forgotten everything. And you know why that is? Because they didn't use that, in that information. You provided them all that knowledge, but then you didn't, find, you didn't provide them any way to channel it so that they'd actually have to use it regularly. And so it all starts to drift away. So I advocate for um, you know, providing activities and a system of activities where after the developers learn the knowledge, then we're going to put them right to work on the next day, actually using the, the, the pieces that they need, you know, that, that we provided them from a knowledge perspective. And then uh, the last part is I really am a huge advocate of security community. Okay, and I think security community, I, I think you really can't even have a successful training program in your organization without having a security community organization that, that kind of is the sponsor for it. Because security community, you know, and I had to throw security champions in there because I've seen it on like five different talks here, and I've been a huge advocate for that idea for 10 years now, so I just love the fact that it's coming out in, in the public here. 
Um, but you need that community of people to support. If you're going to build a training program like this, you can't do it with one person. Um, you, need a, you need a community of people to come behind you and help you create the content and, and all the pieces that are going to go into this. Um, so those security champions by way of the community is a great way to actually do that. And so I bring all, all of these pieces together into what I've affectionately referred to as application security awareness. So it's really not, you know, it's not like it's that new of a term or I created something, you know, that's, that's that uh, hard to see. Um, but application security awareness is, is taking that awareness piece, taking the knowledge and the history, rolling it up with the activities, providing the community that wraps around it, and then that's kind of a whole piece that can be, you know, distributed and sent to or provided for an organization to build. And just a quick uh, explanation for where this kind of fits. So um, it, it kind of sits between secu tra traditional security awareness of don't let people follow you in the door, um, you know, uh, don't trust people when you pick up the phone and they say they're from Microsoft or whatever. You know, that's the traditional security awareness side. And then security training is the class, I think of as the classroom five day training sessions and things. So I think of this application security awareness idea somewhere in the middle. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, of traditional security training. Um, just because I think from a resource perspective, if you have 20,000 developers, there's no way you're sending everybody to a week of class this year. You might be able to do it over 10 years, but you can't afford the resource hit that that, that, that boils down to, you know. Um, so, and, and I find that the traditional training does tend to be more boring. And uh, so I, I like to create content that's engaging, that's fun, that people aren't afraid to laugh at and, and wonder, you know, what does this have to do with security or whatever. Um, so I try to stay away from scripts and teleprompters and things and, you know, provide them with a journey that they can follow. So a couple of quick uh, benefits about these types of programs. So the first one is, is laying that foundation with everybody in the organization, okay? So if we get everyone a foundational knowledge of application security, when, if you're part of a central security team and you go to meet with a, a team, you don't have to start by explaining, well, this is what an exploit is, this is what a vulnerability is, this is what cross-site scripting is. You know, we want all of those pieces to be, we want everybody to know that vocabulary. Maybe they can't, uh, maybe they don't know, maybe they're not an expert and maybe they can't hack a website with cross-site scripting, but at least they should understand in two sentences what is cross-site scripting. Um, Another benefit that we talked about already was, you know, avoid repeating history, right? We don't want to redo, we don't want to recreate the same problems over and over again that we've had in the past. Gives us a mission, you know, through our security activity, we can target some things that we want developers to do. Um, your your organization is going to have a different list than mine or, or any of the other one else in the room because we all have different priorities, but the activities give us a nice way to channel those. Um, and then, you know, this type of a program does build that security community for you. And so, uh, just to answer the question, so what, what you know, why, why can I stand up here and talk about this, this type of a program and what have I done with this? Um, so I created a program at Cisco that encompasses all the things that I'm talking about here. And over, you know, uh, the last few years, around 30,000 people at Cisco went through that, and it wasn't a mandatory training which is the, the amazing thing that, that I'm still amazed by. Nobody told the people you have to do it. It went viral within the company and people just started to go into it because it's, it was a different approach to training. So um, the next you know, number of slides that describe how I think you can do this for yourself, isn't, this isn't just theoretical. I've, got the, you know, I've, I've spent the, the, the blood, sweat, and tears that go into actually making something like this a reality. So there, there's four different things that I think you have to consider when you're building a program like this. Uh, the first one's the program architecture. Second is what content you'll have that'll come into this. Third is how will you incorporate humor and using story to make the, the experience better for the user. And the fourth thing is this idea of gamification, right? How are we going to take the, the successful things of video games and whatnot and include them within our, our platform here to engage people and get them to come back and continue learning about security. So first, from a, from a program architecture perspective, we've got a number of steps we have to go through to lay out what does this program actually, what's it actually going to look like. Um, so this is, you know, figuring out kind of a plan, um, making sure we have a vision and, you know, an execution for how, how this program is actually going to come together. 
And so the first thing that I like to do with one of these things is I like to assess the security culture. And there's many different ways that we can go about doing this. Um, you know, if you're inside the organization already, um, it can be as simple as walking around and talking to people, right? Um, when I was at Cisco, I would do that sometimes just at random. If I visited a random location, I would just see somebody in the hallway and say, oh, what do you know about security? And just stop and wait to see, you know, kind of what. Um, you can get more, you know, more focused than that. You can, you can have, you know, strategic focus groups and, and interviews of different people. All, all we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how good are we at security right now. And then if you want to get more formal, you've got this, you know, you've got the OWASP Open SAM project that you can use to, to actually do a kind of a formal assessment. So you've got all kinds of different, you know, levels of, of detail that you can go into here. You can um, be very informal all the way up to a, mo a more formal approach. But the idea is we're trying to figure out what is the problem space here that, that our training program is going to try to fix. Okay, and I, I threw out some examples of, you know, things I've seen in the past. Perhaps there is a lack of just general AppSec knowledge in the organization. Um, I've seen places where people just had no idea what this idea of a threat landscape is and how it continues to evolve and grow and get bigger over time. Um, perhaps people don't understand the development practices and the tools that you have, or in many cases, they don't have the motivation to actually improve security and you know, make things better. So you have to define the problem. So you have, to, you have to write that down and figure out what are we even aiming at, what are we shooting for, um, what do we want to do. And then the, uh, the task of building a team. So like I said, you can't do this, it's really not reasonable to do this as one person. Um, I started in, at the center of this within the walls of Cisco, but quickly invited many people that were from different business units and different organizations to come and help me be, be part of this and be on the ground floor for it. Um, there, there's a couple different roles that you need assistance with. Um, you need people to help you author content, okay? Um, authoring content is not something that you want to sign up for to do all of that. Okay, uh, the program I built at Cisco, by the time I left, had over 100 modules included within it. Um, of those, I think I wrote 10 of them. And I reviewed 100, but I wrote 10. So that brings you to the reviewer perspective, you know. Um, you need to have people that can help you review this content. And the other thing is, um, there's some folks that may not even be part of the security team that can actually help you as part of this, this team approach. I learned about this idea that there are people that, that have the job title of psychometrician, okay, which I thought was a really cool job title. I think I might want to have a business card that says I'm a psychometrician. Um, but what they do, they're experts in learning. Okay? These are people that understand how people learn visually, you know, from an, from an auditory perspective, um, experience, behavior. And what they can do is they can take, so, so I didn't say this at the beginning, but I'm a security person for you know, 20 years of my career. I'm not, a, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a trainer, or I'm not an expert in how people learn. So I don't always think about the best ways to teach something, I just do it my way. Um, but it's nice to have these psychometrician folks come in and actually give you some advice and say, well, you know, you might want to change these things because you're actually, you know, you're leaving out a whole population that you're trying to teach along the way. Um, and then, yeah, so the community becomes part of this team as well. So your first big design decision is, what is your theme going to be? Okay, you, uh, theme, the, the theme, you can use this as a way to make this more fun. You can use this as a way to kind of have a marketing vehicle. Um, at Cisco, the theme that we used was the security ninja. Okay, everybody wanted to be a security ninja at Cisco. Because it's just, it's fun. We drew, had little cartoons about it. And, you know, we were able to market the program kind of from that perspective. Um, that may not work for every organization. I realize that. So you may want to, you know, um, use like a security apprentice, security journeyman, security expert or whatever, security master. Um, there's, there's many different themes. And what I find is you can look within your own organization to actually find some themes, find some things that people are interested in. Uh, the second desi design decision is levels. Okay? So how are you going to turn this into more than just a single course that somebody takes and goes away with. And what I did at Cisco is I built this out as five individual levels where, you know, learning at the white belt was the foundational knowledge, applying was role specific, doing and leading and leader is where you start to actually do the activities that go into this. 
Uh, but it's important that people have, people want to see the journey that exists for them to become a more proficient security person, a more proficient developer. Okay, they want to be able to see that if I'm starting here as a, as a newbie with this basic knowledge that there's this black belt thing that exists off in the distance and I can see all the jumps along the way that I have to go to get there. The third design decision you have to do is, you know, what are the roles that you're going to go after specifically in the organization? And you can, you can go after any role that exists, you know, within, within your company here. You know, I tend to focus in the beginning on the software uh, developers, the testers, the sometimes the hardware people, and then the manager folks that are potentially roadblocking all those other people from doing security. So you got to teach, I got to teach them too because I want them and, and their content looks a lot different than what I teach a developer. I'm teaching the manager about resources and, and what happens if, you know, you don't give resources to people to fix security problems. How does that turn into a negative? Um, but the point is that you can actually, you can choose the roles that you want. You can start small and then work your way up. Uh, activities and behaviors, so this is, uh, this is a, a, a basic set of activities that I like to start with to uh, determine, you know, what are, what, are the, what are the behaviors that I want to try to encourage people to do? You know, from a building, you know, they're building tools, they're mentoring, they're building security features, they're um, exploring a vulnerable web app like WebGoat. You know, all of these things are going are gonna to reinforce what those facts were that we provided to them you know, that we, that we put into their brains. Then we've got to figure out how are we going to recognize people with this program, okay? And what, um, there's many different ways you can recognize. You don't always have to just hand out cash. Um, you can do things like, like at Cisco, I created specific lanyards, like the one that you're wearing around your neck right now for the conference. And on those lanyards, I wrote white belt. And people loved to, after they earned their white belt, get one of those lanyards, wear it, and show off to everyone in the building. You know, look at me, I'm a, I'm a white belt now. Um, I've seen certificates work. I've seen sending emails to managers and, and other people be a, a viable recognition. Um, but in the end, hard, hard, you know, cold, hard cash is always a good way to, you know, to, to you know, and I hate to say bribe because that's such a, you know, such a bad word, I guess. But to, for me, you know, $100 in exchange for somebody having a basic understanding of application security is a really small investment. When you think about how much one vulnerability, if that, if that same person creates a vulnerability in the code, think about the hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions of dollars that could potentially be at risk there. So that $100 turned into a really cheap type of thing for me. Um, Budgeting, so, so the, the, the idea here is this, these things don't happen overnight. So don't think you're going to leave the AppSec EU conference, you're going to go crank out some content, and you know, by September your developers are going to be locked in and dialed into security, right? Security culture change takes, takes a couple of years, um, so you just have to be patient, but the thing is you have to start the process. You can't just say, oh, well, that takes too long. You've got to get on the train somewhere you know, to, to, make it, to make it even successful. Okay, so now getting into a little bit more of the nitty-gritty details. So from a content perspective, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of video, okay, because I work with large companies, and like I said, I, they can't send 20,000 people to a uh, training class each year, but they can have 20,000 people watch small vi videos on their own time, you know, during the workday when they have small breaks and things. Uh, so I'm a huge fan of video. Um, I like to do a, a format of content that I call conversational and unscripted. Okay? Now, this makes the, the learning people in the world very uh, nervous because learning people like to have scripted content that's very well controlled. Um, but I'd rather have conversations on video with security people talking about a particular issue or a, or, or a foundational concept because conversations are just more interesting to listen to, right? Why do people watch late night television talk shows all over the world? Uh, because it's interesting to listen to people have conversations. If that was a scripted, if those talk shows were scripted and they just read the text to you all day, nobody would watch them. They'd be boring. So um, that's the idea from content. Uh, I want to have assessments for every module that I do, so I want questions. I don't write these things to make it, you know, I'm not looking for PhDs in security at that, <laughs> that the end of my program here. Uh, I want to make sure they, they caught on to the core concepts that I provided them in, in the training content. So, um, the, you know, I give 10 to 20 questions. I have that psychometrician person look at that for me and, and check it out. Um, 
The third thing I provide for each piece of content is resources. Okay? There is always a percentage of people that want to dive much deeper into the topic. So what I try to do is I try to create a really short, you know, 10 to 20 minute description of security vocabulary. Now at the end of that, or, or in this example, threat modeling, right? A 20 minute ex explanation of what is threat modeling, how does it work? There will be 20% of the people that watch that module that go, this is cool, I want to dive deeper, so I give them resources right away. Here's links you can go if you want to get into this deeper and be more involved. Uh, so from a white belt or a level one content map, here's, here's some of the foundational lessons that I like to see uh, get included at that, that basic level. Security fundamentals is about the vocabulary. Attacks and attackers, why would someone want to attack our organization? Um, and who are they? Uh, the, the security myths, this is a great one. You can have a lot of fun with this because, you know, oh, the firewall will protect me. Oh, we have SSL. All of these things that go through developers' minds, um, this is a fun way to kind of squash that. Uh, from a, this is just a rough idea from a level two perspective, from a, a content map. Um, thinking about what are some of the things I'd want a web developer specifically to, uh, to learn about. Um, you know, you have uh, secure design principles are, is something that's, that can be applied across, you know, any language. And then I want to see things that are specific to their environment, so secure coding for JavaScript. And then I like to provide them with kind of the other side of, from the tester perspective, you know, how can you then stop and test, or, yeah, test the application that you just wrote along the way. Um, quickly, here is this idea of content creation. So um, this is the process that I kind of refined in my time at Cisco building, you know, building this type of content. Um, I like to start with an outline, and you'll see there's two different instructional designer reviews. Those are those, those, those learning people who are real smart about how people learn. Um, so I like to have them look at my outline, and then I like them have them look at the slides that I use as the backdrop for my content you know, before, I, before I go ahead and call that final um, with a technical review and whatnot along the way. So humor and story. So this is, this is the way that you make your training program fun. Okay? Um, you, you have to, to find some people that are part of your community that are, uh, you know, nighttime or part-time stand-up comedians or whatever that are just willing to think a little bit about how can we do some things to, to make this content be a little bit more fun. And, you know, I, I, I do this with a couple of different ideas. These are things I've done in the past, but, you know, I've had um, still cartoons created. So still cartoons, what I mean by that is it's just like a comic strip with somebody doing audio over the top of it. You can make those pretty, for, for really cheap. You just have to figure out what are the jokes that you're going to include in it. Um, and what I did with, and, and this, this, th these examples here, they don't necessarily all have to be humor related, you know. Um, I did one where we used a kind of a metaphor of, well, you, this is within the, the context of um, the security ninja, we used this kind of town as the metaphor where the, these little security ninjas were, were guarding the town. And then we went through a whole bunch of different scenarios where somebody was trying to jump over the wall and then we would make an analogy or draw an illustration from there. Uh, with another one, I actually did some full motion cartoons that was considerably more expensive. And then um, video is another way that, that we can do this. It's amazing what you can do on a green screen, you know, in front of a, you can put yourself anywhere. And, and what we did from a video perspective is, you know, we would spoof different movies, you know, um, probably about half the people in the room are old enough to remember Office Space, the movie. Um, but we did, we did a whole series where we had one guy dressed up as Milton and I got to play the boss, you know, and so we just did, but we had little security, uh, you know, uh, things mixed into it as well. So, um, so yeah, I mean, make, and what we did is we attached some of this, a little bit of this humor to every video module. And sometimes we had people coming back because, to watch the next module because they just wanted to figure out what is the crazy thing these people are going to attach to a video next. You know, so it's a way to draw people you know, back into the environment here. Now, when we talk about humor, we have to have a word of caution. Because, as it turns out, corporate humor is not universal. <laughs> and um, so, so my approach to this is I try to strive for a PG rating at most, for any of the content, any of the humor things that I do, you know, within the environment. Um, we had a, a, a Hollywood scriptwriter actually write a, a set of cartoons for us, and he, I, I don't know what, he never said what he did, but he did like some sitcoms and things, and um, he sent me back a script, and I'm reading through this thing going, 
I mean, it was an R-rated script. I'm going, if I, make, if I turn these into cartoons, I will not have to worry about working here anymore because, you know, I'll be quickly without a job. So I had to send it back to him and say, hey, um, you know, can you make this PG rating? Because we're kind of a big company. People are, you know, sensitive. And he's like, oh, yeah, I get it. So he gave me a rewrite and took out all the very controversial kind of things, and it all worked out in the end. Uh, but aim for a TV PG, and you'll be safe. You know, you don't want to be G where it's just, you know, cartoon animals running around and everything. You know, you can be a little bit edgy, but... You know, you don't want to offend anybody is, is the big takeaway here. That, that would be bad. Okay, from a gamification perspective, um, gamification is thrown around all over the place now. Um, so gamification does not mean adding a video game into the middle of your training program. Okay? That's like the most misused definition of this. It's, it's how do we apply the principles that we know work uh, that make games addictive and interesting to people. Um, how do we apply those things? And you, know, you can do that with badges, for example. Right? If you go to any of the code school, code, any of the code academy kind of websites and things, like, they all have badges now for the classes that you do. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bigger fan of the, you know, using the idea of a security belt. I just think that has, it's more tangible than a, than a, um, than a badge. Uh, but I also think like the rewards and money and things, those all play in, and points and whatnot all play into the overall gamification idea. Um, another thing you can do is, you know, you can take your theme and you can turn your interface that you use for people to actually get into the training, turn that into more of a game-like environment, you know? Um, this is kind of a poor man's cobbled together idea of, of how you could do it. But if you had the theme of Security Ninja, show your modules. Um, as the modules are, you know, being completed, maybe the wall of the castle's getting knocked down or something. I don't know what we're going to do with it. Um, but I know that if you need advice on gamification and you have a teenager, ask them. Okay? My, my son's a huge gamer, and so I actually asked him sometimes, why do you play that game? And it's very interesting to, to get the perspective of, you know, what draws him into a particular games. So ask them, they can actually help you. And then one more um, big, big gamification idea is build in some competition throughout your organization. Okay? Have a way, have a nice dashboard that r runs up all the way to the SVP level that shows how many people have taken the training at each of the levels. Because then what you can do is once you have that information, you, when you're talking to an SVP who might have a, a low score, like maybe they only have 5% of their people have gone through the training, you can suggest, oh, did you see how your peer over there was doing in the, uh, on the leaderboard here? Look, they're at 67%, you're at 5%. Wow, that's terrible. You know? And immediately that SVP picks up the phone to their operations director and says, I don't know what this thing is, but fix it. Okay? Make my number better. I, gotta be, I can't get beat like that. So, um, so dashboards are a nice way to track what's happening in the world and also a good uh, competition thing. So just to summarize here from a, from a takeaway perspective, everybody in this room knows vulnerabilities are real and everywhere. Um, but my approach to changing security culture, open their eyes, okay? make them aware of what the challenge is out there, fill their brains with that knowledge and history, um, and then give them something to do with it after. Put them to work to improve security after that. And then if you want to build one of these programs yourself, think about, you know, what do I have to do from an architecture perspective? What's the content that I want to go after? How do I roll in humor and story into this? And then um, how can I apply some gamification principles to make this thing uh, more appealing to my audience? And so my, I guess my first call to action is, you know, you can build one of these things, right? I mean, when I started the program at Cisco five years ago, I just said, okay, I think we'll just build it. We'll just go for it. Um, and you may have a smaller organization. It may mean you have a smaller program and whatnot, but it is possible, and I want to challenge everybody here. If you're part of a big organization, go start the process of building something like this. You, know? you get one or two years into it, you'll look back and go, I can't believe we didn't ever do this before. And then a, uh, a plug for a new OWASP project, and that is the OWASP Security Ninja project, which is going to take many of the principles that I have here and actually create a version that's specific to OWASP. So um, this is, you know, something that we're certainly always going to be looking for more people to, uh, to come in and help with that. So you can find it on the wiki if you want to see more details of what we have initially planned for that. And with that, I would love to take a question or two or three. Start here. Yeah, so the question is, is this apply to everybody in the organization? And what I've done in the past been for just developers or everyone in the organization? Um, my past experience has been, we've, the developers were our main target, 
But then we started to expand into those other roles because we had a big success. Uh, but developers was the first thing we did. Uh, but then we found that it, when you get into role, you can even teach some basic things to salespeople about the processes that you have. Imagine the power your salesperson has when they get that question, well, what do you do about you know, building trusted products in your company? Oh, well, we have a secure development life cycle. Um, we do vulnerability testing. Does that salesperson know all the, can they do that? Do they know all the details? No, but at least they know we do that as a company. So it's a way to, it's a way to kind of, you know, the way to expand those roles even further. All right, right here. Ah, so the question is, large companies have a non-sharing attitude to security. How would I change that? Um, wow, that's a great question. I don't know that, uh, I, don't know that I can change <laughs> large companies. And, and it's something that I battled with throughout my time in corporate America in the past is wanting to share new tools and things. Um, I, I think that we just have to, we really have to demonstrate what is the benefit from a reputation perspective. I think that's what a lot of management people miss when, they, when you say, well, we could release this. Then the, all they see is that that's a support nightmare. I've got to probably re, you know, have somebody look at this code for 10, 15 years. Uh, they have to see, you have to paint them the picture of what's the benefit for the reputation of our company as being seen as someone who is a player in, say, the, say the OWASP world, right? Say you were to take some, a tool you had internally and release it to OWASP and open, you know, through OWASP and open source it. You know, you got to sell the reputational value of what that does to everyone else in the security community when they look at your company. All right, any more questions? Right here, yes, sir. Uh, so the question is, uh, any research into gamification? What was the type of theory? Skinner box theory. No, I didn't, uh, but I'd love to hear about it after. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, I'm not sure. All right, okay, sir. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, from a from a metrics perspective, um, I'm always afraid to get. Oh, I'm sorry. So, what are the um, from the, the the question was from the um, return on investment perspective? What is the uh, what, what what do I what do I use and what do I recommend from there? Um, I'm always afraid to use vulnerabilities as a metric. I, I hate when people say, well, you know, or, or security bugs. Like, oh, we have you know 10% less security bugs this month. Well, that doesn't mean anything, right? Um, what I'm more interested in is how long does it take to fix a security bug? That's an interesting, that is a metric that you should see over, slowly over time go down to, to less and less time the more people that become aware about application security because they're just, they're going to know what to do much quicker and be able to identify it. So that, that's a big one. Um, I, I've always used, you know, total number of people trained and, and things like that. Um, there, there's also some things you can do from a behavior perspective. Um, if you want to look at specifically what are the, you know, what are the metrics that can come out of the training program, um, there's something called the Kirkpatrick model that I learned about from my learning friends. Um, but what it does is it measures, uh, it measures the effectiveness of a given learning program. And I, I really honed in on what they call their level three, which is behavior change. So um, what I did is, at Cisco is I would, I would send a survey to somebody after they finished a, a, a given level, and I would ask them the question two different ways. Before you, learned, before you took this belt, how would you answer this question? You know, how would you deal with, you know, would you do threat modeling? And then after you took the information, or after you took the training, what would you do? And it gives you a nice metric to say, this is the behavioral change, which is then reinforced by the activities. All right, any more questions? Way in the back. Yeah, so the question is, how do we manage this? And the short answer is it was baked into the LMS, but it was baked in with a lot of customizations. And we had a whole front end, uh, we had a whole front end uh, infrastructure that was set up to contain this game-based interface. And then we used, we had to rely on the LMS on the back end because that was the, the way big companies like to do it. 
Yeah, one last question right here. How do you, so the question is, how do you engage with salespeople and managers? I, I think that, um, you know, you, you have to, they, they have to understand what the value is that you're going to provide to them, right? So if you tell them to go through this training, um, you, have to sell, you have to answer that. Remember I said right towards the beginning of this talk, start with the why, right? Don't just throw them, say, here's a bunch of technical details to a manager about how, to, how you need to apply your resources to security. Step back and answer the why question. Why are you as a manager should care about this? Well, if a vulnerability c goes through your team, it could result in, um, you know, from 100 to 100,000 to a million dollars in cost to the company. Then that manager has a whole different outlook on, and we're not trying to do scare tactics. I'm not trying to make people not sleep at night, right? Um, maybe I am, but um, yeah. So, I mean, just st start with why. P provide them that foundation and that'll help them along the way. All right, I'm going to hang around up here if you've got any more questions right now, but need to get you guys to the lunch line. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.